Hello, I'm chairing today's event. Uh, to tell you a little bit about myself, I'm the director of a charity called the International Broadcasting Trust. I'm a former documentary maker and Channel 4 commissioning editor. And my charity is involved in encouraging broadcasters to cover the sort of issues that we're all interested in. So this is a topic close to my heart. Um, the format today is, I'll introduce the speakers, then we'll have three short presentations, and we have two discussants, which is a new term for me, which uh, means two other speakers who <laughs> get the conversation going uh, whilst you're warming up, then we come to you. So when we come to you, we, we don't just want questions and answers. We, we want to hear opinions and we want, a, we want a real conversation. So that at the end of the day, uh, we have a much clearer idea of the challenges of covering um, global issues in mainstream documentaries, but also the opportunities and maybe some concrete learnings that uh, you all want. Um, so let me introduce everyone first. Uh, James Georgalakis is director of your director of communications here, and James previously worked in the NGO sector in senior roles at Every Child and Sight Savers. So he understands how academics see these issues, but he also understands um, NGOs perspectives and those of media because he worked with media quite closely. Um, next uh, we have next him Jezza Newman, who is a documentary producer and director, and he'll, he'll so sh show some clips. He's a very modest guy, but he is, I have to say this, he has won five BAFTAs for his films, so he's oh, very, wow. uh, you, <laughs> please don't applaud him, he'll be very <laughs> embarrassed. Um, he's, a, he's a storyteller, and he regularly tells stories about human rights, poverty, TB, HIV, and he'll tell us more about his, his particular approach and some of the ethical dilemmas that he's faced as a filmmaker. Uh, next to Jezza, we have Kinti Rowland, who's a research fellow here and co-director of the Centre for Social Protection. So she has a, a strong interest in child poverty and social protection. She also has worked with NGOs, including UNICEF and CONCERN. Next we have our two important discussants. So first of all we have Jackie, who is a research fellow here, Jackie Shaw. Um, her, her main field of research is participatory uh, videos. She works with communities in developing countries um, to build accountability. Uh, so she has, she has a slightly different perspective from the other panelists. Then we have Sophie Robinson, who works here as an external affairs officer and has previously worked uh, with NGOs like Shelter, but she's in regular contact with media, so she's here to give us a sort of reality check for what, what, what journalists and documentary filmmakers want um, and how that, can, that potential divide can be bridged. So um, let's uh, kick off with Jezza. Before he speaks, I just want to give you a feel for his um, approach to filmmaking. I think you might have to, can you all see? We're going to show a clip from one of his films called Kids in Camps. Over 51 million people are currently fleeing armed conflict, more than at any time since the Second World War and almost half of them are children. They come shooting, they were killing everyone. Whether you are a man, woman, a young, whatever, you are blind, deaf, they put them inside the house, then you, they just burn the house. But what's it like as a child to lose everything that is familiar and safe and find yourself trying to build a new life in a refugee camp? I don't even today where are we going to sleep. There's no home, no house. Can you still be a child when war is forcing you to grow up? Rooney, what? Rooney, run, 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 run. 
And what do the children think is most important when their world has been turned upside down? I just want to go back to school and complete my studies. I want to be in those lives before. Four children show us what life is like when you are forced to flee your home. The life of refugees is not that good. There is no future development. Only you eat, you sleep. That is the end. Tell us a bit about that film and your approach as a filmmaker. Sure, so um, I sort of started out um, accidentally directing a film um, which did quite well called China Stolen Children and as a result I kind of got a name for myself to A, making films about kids and secondly um, going to places that are slightly dodgy. Um, I've been rather lucky then quite clever, I'd like to think, that I've managed to avoid direct bullets, um, but go to places that are perceived as very dangerous. So I've been to Gaza, but I was there after the Israelis had finished bombing regularly. Um, I was in Zimbabwe, but working undercover. Um, and then this was in South Sudan during the Civil War. Um, but the areas we're in, we pretty much made, were able to avoid those areas. But to, to go into these sorts of places, you've got to be high risk trained. And I am. So I've spent a lot of time making films through the perspective of children because, you know, the children are the next generation, they're our future, um, and I think they have an awful lot to say and very rarely get an opportunity to do so. Um, but for me, generally speaking, I will just land in a country and um, try and find the story. I, I have a rough idea of where I think the story might be. But um, it's not something that's prescripted. It's much more about arriving there and looking around and seeing what it was. So when I made this film, I've been commissioned by BBC One and Comet Relief um, to make a film. Um, I've been trying to get this off the ground for five years. Um, and I've actually literally taken everything, the last chance to move it. I wrote it up as a, a film. It was about the perspective of growing up as a child in a refugee camp. That's what I wanted to tell, that's what I wanted to explore. So it was originally framed around uh, in, um, the DRC. But when it went to the commissioning editor, they looked at it and they said, well, I don't think DRC is next year. So that was it. And uh, so I, I said, well, that's just one country, because you said you're interested. We framed it, we framed it. Cleaned it off my hard drive, and then uh, Brian, who I worked with, had a meeting with Comet Relief, and they said, well, we do this, we do this, and we work with refugees as well. And so he said, well, what about kids in camps, you know, refugee camps? And they said, yeah. I said, oh, Jez has got an idea about that. So this got off the ground, but when I arrived there... Um, so, Jez, can you tell, what was the brief that BBC One gave you, and how much freedom did you have as a filmmaker? So the, the, the brief was, um, was literally to, to, to draw out the stories that I'd said were, were sort of thematic stories. So the, the brief I had was based around the thematic narrative. So it's looking at food, education, um, medicine, um, those elements of what it's like and, and what effect that has on a child's development within the camp. So it's very much based around themes because you, you don't know what your unfolding narrative will be. So that's what you have to try and find to make a great film. Um, so that's what I was searching for when I was there in, in the refugee camps. And when you're making long form documentary, you've obviously, I've obviously got time and I'm going to be coming back again and again, which is very different to news. And news, you arrive for a day, you grab what you want and you have a much more prescriptive um, this goal, if you like, and, and that's something that I have to battle against a lot because I arrived in, in, in northern Uganda, which is also in this film, and literally I turned up at the Save the Children office and they said, okay, so we've got this girl here, she, she got shot at, and then we've got the girl who ran with all her clothing, and then we've got that, and I said, what, sorry, no, um, I don't want to just do an interview and go, I need to tell a story. The, the, and it's that idea of retrospective narrative, so delivering retrospective stories, which is a story where they're telling you about what happened in the past. That is the first two minutes of any film I make. I then need, in the case of BBC, 57 more minutes that have to start when I arrive in the country. So that's the first battle, is getting across to the NGO or the locals or whoever you're dealing with, um, but it's a very different framework. You know, um, It's about what's going forward. 
And so I, they took me out into the camp and wandered around. And, 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 and Kevin, who ran, ran Save There, said to me, you know, we've been walking around all day, you know, and what are you looking for? Um, and I said, I don't actually know, Kevin. I'm just looking and absorbing, and I, but I know when I find it. And, uh, and that was just a whole different concept that they can get their head around. That, that, and at one point, I, they were saying, you know, you know, does he actually know what he's doing? Because <laughs> most people come here and say exactly what they want, and, and I don't. And it's, it's, it's very much the same everywhere I go with all the films I make. You have a rough idea about what you want, but you don't exactly know what you want. But it's about finding that, and it's about being patient. And that's, a, again, another thing when you're working with organisations. We, too, if we get it right, we, we're very patient to find the right story. And actually, in the context of this film, we then... So narrative is really important because um, it, it creates the drama and jeopardy in any film. And the reality is we do still need drama and jeopardy. I mean, a good documentary is like a good play. You know, it will have chapters, it will have characters, it will, and something will happen and unfold in front of you. Um, and so that's what you're always looking for. So you meet the little boy who sells sweets on the side of the road, it's kind of like, Okay, so what exactly am I going to film? Day one, little boy gets up, goes to the side of the road, sells sweets. Day two, gets up, goes to the side of the road, sells sweets. So what's happening? You know, is his mother dying of a disease, and, she, and will she die within my framework, within my eight months of filming? If she will, then okay, that could be a story. Um, will there be more war in the area? And it, camp will get attacked and they have to flee and lose everything they've got again, well that would be a story. Um, so you enter into a very dark world where actually um, if I come near you with a camera run because it means that your life is likely to fall apart and bad things are going to happen. Um, but that's what you're looking for. In this instance I was really lucky that the unfolding narrative that I just found was through Grace, who's the last girl to speak there, who says, in a camp you just eat, sleep and go up. Because what she decided to do was, um, was go find an education. And she, there's no secondary school in Wickham Camp. And so her sister Anna could go to primary school, um, but there's nothing for Grace. And so she actually left South Sudan and went to Kenya to find an education. So I followed her on that journey. Do you want to introduce the next clip? Sure, so the, the next clip we've got is from a film I made called TB Return of the Plague here in the UK, because that's the BBC's choice of title, or my choice of title that PBS ran with, which is T TB Silent Killer. My dad, then the older one, me and my brother. It crushes me. My friends of boyfriends or husbands, what man would want a girl with TP, skinny and bone? You see how hard it is? It's very hard. Because even if people just see the face, they'll be like, wow, she's beautiful. But come see the whole body. It's scary. No guy would fall for that. I've took every single injection they have on their regimen. Every tablet. I'm not going to win this battle. See, I'm not going to win it. I never will. Instead, it's just killing me slowly. Next thing, I'll be crazy out there. Because this thing's slowly eating me up. It, it will take a while. But the disease is progressing. It will progress to a point where she probably cannot uh, um, use the pit of lungs she's left with. I am deaf because of TB. I lost my parents and my sister because of TB. I've been out of school now because of TB. I can't enjoy my youthful days because of TB. I'm not living like every other people with their siblings in the same house because of TB. Like seriously now, how many things 
are going bad for me is just cause of TB. You see, I really don't care about the stigma because I'm now able to stay alone. But like seriously, all these things, just cause of TB. It's not fair. It's really not fair. So can you tell us how that film came about? That was, it was quite tough getting that permission too. Yeah, that, that took, a, took a while to get off the ground, but um, very luckily for us, uh, BBC4 um, commissioned it as a 90-minute film, um, which was, was, was amazing because, you know, again, it's, you know, Swaziland is a place that not many people, you know, know much about, so it's not, you know, sort of, a, it's directly on the map, so to speak. So it was a faraway place. It was going to be wheel-to-wheel -wheel subtitling. I mean, obviously, in this case, we were very lucky that we found somebody who was highly educated and can tell that, and really demonstrate that TB does, doesn't just hit the, the poor and the destitute, it can hit anybody. Um, and sadly, she lost her life. Um, but, uh, but, but yeah, we're very, very lucky that we, we managed to get her on, on BBC4. And in fact, when PBS came on board, they were just going to take 20 minutes of it. And then I kept saying, no, 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 you need to see more, you need to see more. And so then it went to 60. And then I said to Wayne, well, yeah, you really are. And I sent loads of photographs. There's another child in the film called Mucky Beggar, who's so cute. And I sent her lots of photographs of cute Mucky Beggar saying, come on, come on. And eventually they took it as a 90 as well, which was amazing because for Doctors Without Borders in the US, they were able to use that film. And we screened a bit at the summits and we screened at the Kaiser Family Institute. It's been shown in Madrid. But that film was really hard to make because people don't walk around with a sign on their head saying, I've got TB. You know, um, and you know this before a doctor does. So how do I take a room like this and try and find one of you who has TB but you don't know it yet? So I'm going to fill with you first, and then you're going to be told you have it, and your life's going to fall apart around you. And that's what I needed to do. I needed to tell the story. Um, and so there's a real dilemma because we managed to work with. Um, we were invited into the country by MSF, so they were supporting us, and they are the predominant um, sort of outside force working with TB. But there was a Bayer clinic there as well, and then there was the government hospitals. So we set about making friends with some of the um, some of the doctors, and and eventually we found one who was really forward thinking, who who knew what we needed to do, who felt this story desperately needed to be told, and needed a, a platform. So we had to sit down and have this discussion of how long can you wait to tell a patient they have multi drug resistant TB so that we could film with them. So you, you knew she had it before she knew it. So what happened is um, they were doing group testing, so they were bringing children in, um, testing them, sending them away, and as soon as the results came back in, so because they had to do two tests on them, then they would inform the children. So there would be a window, there would be a natural window between receiving the results in the clinic and getting out to the child to tell them. But that could be an hour, that could be the same day if the child waited around. So the question then was, ethically, how long could you reasonably argue was a reasonable amount of time it could have taken you on the worst day if you were delayed getting the tests out to her how long could you wait you know could you wait three days could you wait two days one day and it came down to 12 hours 12 hours is the window i got to fill and and that was between the you test coming in her sure for a day before she knew that you knew you were filming someone who was going to get we knew, so we knew she was going to get the results, and we knew that she was she that she definitely had TB, but we didn't know whether she had multi drug resistant TB or not. Let's let's come back to that with the audience, but we'll get on key team next. Mine will also start with a very brief clip. Okay, so uh, I can an experiment by Channel 5 giving people money to live on benefits. So what, what, what's the connection there with the subject under discussion? So about a year and a half ago, IDS was uh, contacted by the production company developing this program, the Great British Benefits 
handout, which wasn't called like that at the time. But um, And the idea was to give people their year's worth of benefits in one lump sum amount. And it was modeled on graduation type programs that we also see in developing countries based on the rationale that people need one big push to, to grow out of poverty rather than regular small amounts every month. And so it was actually really um, exciting to be contacted by a company, production company, wanting to um, develop this for national TV and to connect something that we were working on in countries like Burundi and Bangladesh to um, an experiment in the UK. But weren't you a bit sceptical that it was Channel 5? Well, at that, time, Channel 5 at that time they told me they were planning this for the BBC, so actually we didn't know it was Channel 5, but we were sceptical. So on the one hand we thought this is really exciting and it might be a really good uh, way for us to, um, to also showcase what we're doing and make that connection. So, we, so I was asked to provide advice and it was a bit unclear as to whether that would be on TV or off TV or whether that would be formal or informal. But we were also very aware of the risks. So of course this is a program about benefits um, and about the extent to which this would just feed into the rhetoric about welfare dependency um, or just be another program in the under the label of poverty porn, as it's called. Um, and so in the end, we did decide in discussion also with James and others in the Institute, that it might be better to provide informal advice or have informal discussions about how this experiment could be framed so it might work. Um, also because we didn't know how they were going to actually edit it all and put it all together and how it was going to be broadcasted. Um, and so, I, I've been in touch with the with the producer over time, and then at some point I noted it was actually broadcasted on Channel 5. It was on last February, and so for the purposes of this introduction, I also looked at some of the Facebook comments alongside the trailer that was on uh, the Channel 5 Facebook page to see whether some of the um, excitement about this experiment or the concerns about poverty porn were actually... Um, showing up in these comments. So if we see the first ones, there were a few comments to that trailer that actually um, picked up on the positive side of this experiment. So there's a reference to Tony and Diane, and then also Scott and Leanne, these are two couples, um, saying, well, you know, they deserve a break with the money. The PS4 refers to the PlayStation 4 that they bought for their son in the very first day, I think, after they got the money. This was one positive comment. You can imagine that there were many more negative ones. And then also some who said, well, actually, it might help them start their business, which was, of course, the very purpose of that experiment. Now, there were a few of these comments, but this was the, the small, small minority. Um, so another set of comments referred to um, actually that this is not the right experiment to do because there's a lot of people who are working and they are living in very tough conditions as well. And so in a way I found that interesting because it, it actually picks up on some of the um, issues with this experiment that we see also in our work. But of course it came from, from largely from people who are working very hard and saw this, this program as um, taking the piss, really, of their situation. The next uh, one then really picked up on our biggest concern, I think. People just making nasty comments about the people participating in the program, the three couples, what they spent the money on, that they're lazy. So there's a comment about the PlayStation 4. There was also a couple who had invested in a... Um, party, setting up a party company for uh, kids' parties, and they bear <coughs> a lot of uh, wild animals. That didn't work out very well, and of course, <coughs> there are plenty of comments on that on Twitter and Facebook. But then, what I actually also found surprising at the, with these last two comments on Facebook is that many people actually were really um, critical of Channel 5, just on the basis of that trailer, that they were putting forward another one of those benefits programs and actually 
engaging with this kind of programming. And I found that interesting because I looked at the program and there were lots of problems with the experiments. And I don't think it, would, it worked out as positively as it could have if they had done it differently. But I can't say that they were being very unfair to the people participating. They weren't really... The way in which it was edited or the way in which people were portrayed wasn't really um, making them seem like they were lazy or that they were not, you know, uh, they didn't know what they were doing. Or but people from the outset, many people thought that this was this kind of program is just wrong altogether and we shouldn't be engaging with it. So looking at this um, and at the program as well, I think on the whole, I'm quite happy with the decision that we made, but it does give rise to questions for me as a researcher. How, how can we engage positively with this kind of medium that potentially reaches a very large audience and an audience that we don't normally reach with the work that we do? Um, and how can we do it with those risks in mind? Uh, well, I think when we throw this out um, to the to bigger discussion with the audience, we need to try and distinguish between different types of media. I mean, Channel 5 is very different from BBC 4, which is different from BBC 1. Uh, a, produ <coughs> a producer uh, sh should, should tell you who is broadcasting the show, uh, and you should be asking him or her for that information. They should tell you the working title. They should tell you what's in it and what the point is. You're entitled to interrogate them. There's some Producers have some degree of accountability. Um, <coughs> I mean, maybe you, you can reflect on that in your presentation. Thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, what I'd just add is I, I think social media comments and analysing them, I mean, we all know how yeah. basically dreadful they are um, about almost everything, um, particularly The Guardian for some reason. So, but, I, but I think what was interesting for me when I watched it was that I actually thought their treatment of those participating in it was pretty, showed a lot of humanity and was fair, reasonably fair. Um, but, but, but at the same time, it, 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 there were some real problems with the experiment. But I wanted to pick up on, on in a way, what, what Jezza was talking about. and what he seems to be describing is something of a trade-off that you seem to have to make between kind of the ethical kind of our, our ambitions to be highly ethical in the way that we film um, communities and individuals versus the need to tell a story that works as a story, as a narrative and is powerful. And I've had a, a few experiences of that, not at IDS, but in, but in, in NGOs. And I, I have the two I wanted to very quickly talk about because I think, you know, one for me is where we bent the rules and it was worth it. And one is where we bent the rules and it absolutely wasn't worth it. And I'm very regretful over it. So I'm opening up here, I'm online. So anyway, I'm not, I'm not going to name names of producers and things, but um, you can probably Google afterwards and work out who, what I'm talking about. Um, and I'm also slightly going to cheat, and I hope the chair doesn't mind, because one of my examples is actually ended up being a news package. And I know we're talking about documentaries, but there is a reason I've picked it. So when I was um, uh, in a previous NGO, I, I, was, I was also often on the lookout for stories, but for a different reason to a, a professional filmmaker. I would be travelling in the field with my notebook and my pen, and I'd be meeting and talking to people, and sometimes you would come across an incredible story that had real potential for mainstream media. And then it was my job to try and get persuade someone to tell that story and then a whole chain of decisions um, most of the time it didn't work but I was in Ukraine and um, I was I was able to gain access to a large uh, orphanage in Ukraine and um, we discovered there that it was one of the orphanages that we'd heard was segregating the babies of HIV positive mothers so first things happening is the babies are being separated from their mothers uh, by a health service that was full of prejudice and discrimination and then those babies were being segregated in a locked down unit in this children's home because they were regarded as such a risk to the other children and there was a great deal of, 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 of prejudice and um, misinformation and um, for, the, for the real little babies actually it was simply that they were born to HIV positive mothers I should say it had nothing to do with their actual HIV status and we, we gained access to this unit um, and what I saw there really shocked me so I spoke to some colleagues in the media and managed to gain access to that orphanage for a, a British film crew 
They were the first foreign film crew that had ever set foot inside the orphanage. But the director of the orphanage didn't really understand, know what they were there for, there for. So we didn't have her permission to make the film that they were making. In fact, we were very lucky that it was the assistant director of the orphanage who was there the day they turned up, who was a bit clueless. And sort of these, these sorts of places tend to like foreigners coming in because they are involved in, in sometimes an illegal international adoption uh, racket. And so they actually welcome foreigners with open arms. And even with cameras, this chap seemed to think that was OK. And then they gained access to the, 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 the basically the isolation unit for these children that were born to HIV positive mothers. And this is a still from that, that, that film, which ended up, funny enough, being part of a Channel 5 um, news, news package. Um, so in terms of my responsibilities working for NGO, thinking about people signing release forms and understanding why they're being filmed and blanking out faces and all of these things that we are taught are very important, we break all the rules. And I have no regrets at all. Because if we had explained to the orphanage or to the Ukrainian uh, local authorities, or to anybody really, what we were doing, they would have been thrown out. Um, I think e I think the people who worked in that unit would not have been happy for them to film, given the culture of fear that I encountered inside that institution. So I have no regrets, and I think that's a, an example of, of, of the ethical trade-off, right? But my second example, um, if you want to flip forward, oh, it's just a, no, you can't really make it out, but I'm not showing clips. Um, Similarly, I was travelling in northern Karnataka, in India, uh, and I was looking at, I was working uh, very closely with a local civil society organisation, a woman-led civil society organisation that was dealing with some really um, dreadful um, examples of, of young girls being trafficked into the sex industry up in Mumbai from northern Karnataka. And without going into all the details of how this was happening and the circumstances of it, I met in her village uh, this girl at the time, I think she was about 11, year, 11 years old, and because I was with this local civil society organisation, they were very much embedded in the community, her family and the girl herself were happy to talk to me, and her, her story was, was that she had been, um, there's a practice called the Devadasi, which you can look up if you don't know what it is, and this practice, this very traditional cultural practice has been very corrupted, and has become something else, and she had been... Uh, Involved, her family had become involved in this, and this young girl had dropped out of school. And the, the likelihood was that in the near future she would be sent away um, to work in the sex industry. Um, and again, I got involved with filmmakers, this time documentary filmmakers, and I got involved with quite a, quite a well-known documentary filmmaker who got very excited about telling the story. So we gave her complete access to the community. We assumed that she, that the local civil society organisation would be in a good position to manage that situation. And of course, as I've learned at IDS, there's a lot of power involved. When foreigners turn up with cameras, people kind of lose their heads. And I've seen this again and again. And the, the end result was, and this filmmaker was highly experienced, but the end result was they were pretty much chased out of the village. Um, they put this girl at great risk, they put her family at great risk. The film was made, it went out in Storyville on BBC4, which is a great slot, um, and even included in the final uh, version um, some of these scenes of them being kind of chased out of the village, and very uncomfortable scenes of them interviewing this 11-year-old girl uh, in front of the whole community. When the film was finished um, and was broadcast, I'd like to say there was a tremendous impact from this film. But I couldn't really, having learned what I've learned again at IDS about impact, I couldn't really tell you what that impact was. Maybe it raised some awareness, but actually it was within Karnataka that, that, that we, that, and within India that this issue needed to be raised at the highest levels and within the community, not on BBC4 in the UK. So I deeply regret uh, that experience, and that's where the ethical trade off didn't work. So I think that, you know, uh, it's really interesting because at IDS we have so, uh, some very interesting examples of community-based filmmaking and participatory filmmaking. In fact, just this morning we saw a brilliant example of it from our research director, John Gaventa. And, you know, that's one end of the spectrum in a sense. The other end of the spectrum is, is what happened in, in, in to this girl in northern Connecticut. And it's very interesting to hear what Jessica has to say about trying to get that balance right. Because I think it is important to tell these stories. And I was asked what the main opportunities and challenges and I think they're interlinked. I think the main opportunities are around empowering people to tell their stories in their own way, in their own voices, and also to get stories out there into the public domain, in the public interest.
But the big challenge is then disempowerment of people, um, putting people at risk, um, and and uh, you know being overly extractive in the way that we obtain these stories. Thanks, James. I mean, uh, before we come to Jackie and Sophie, let's just have some contributions from the audience. Um, I think I want to pick up this issue of ethics. I think from James and Jezza, we've heard that the filmmaker has a lot of uh, room for manoeuvre, a lot of power, a lot of influence, um, and that may be something that you're concerned. Jezza has been very honest about the process of making filmmaking, uh, making a film, particularly with the example of the girl who didn't know that she had TB, but he did know. I mean, what what does the audience think about that? Well, I'm, I'm Gerard Rosenberg. I, yeah, I know you. I know you as well. <laughs> I, I used to be creative development director at IBT before Mark started there, and we were a production company back then. Uh, for about 20 years. But you're saying it's not black and white, just expand on that. I mean, I think it's a very risky thing to do. Um, I think, I don't know, I'd have to talk to you more about how you proceeded with that film. It, it looked extremely moving and very powerful and had a very strong dramatic dimension to it. Um, I mean, I would also say that at the time I was at IBT, with some of these difficult issues, we also used drama a lot. Uh, I, I brought drama to IBT, so we, we did feature-length TV films where it was easier to explore some of these things, where the actors were very realistic, but by the same token, we weren't as invasive as we might be using a real young woman who's got TB that will end her life. Now, I, I don't know. I mean, I think these are extremely complex ethical issues, and we used to discuss them all the time at IBT. We produce packs for media producers, raising issues about that. You know, so we've been down that road. Um, nothing is new, really. Um, I think I think there's a spectrum. You were at one end of the spectrum. You were educational yeah. filmmakers, uh, uh, and you 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 were very ethical. And uh, there there is a spectrum. We're talking about how to engage mainstream audiences, mm -hmm. and compromises are involved. This is a film about TB. It lasts 90 minutes, but essentially it is following the lives of people who have TB. It's a human. It's a human drama. It's not an educational film about TB. Let's just have a few audience comments, Jez, and then we'll come back to you. Yeah. Hi, my name is Hannah Waterman. I'm a documentary photographer, and I think that it made for quite an uncomfortable thought to think that you might have known that one of these children. You knew a little bit more. However, as a documentary maker myself, in order sometimes to get that powerful message across, you have to make these really uncomfortable decisions. And sadly the girl died at the end, so she, you know, she's oh, not going that to, it wasn't that girl. Wasn't that girl. Oh, uh, okay. the, is, I mean, this is what the thing is, is that the question is, you're asked one simple question, but what happened afterwards? Does that influence <laughs> your decision on that question? Because if I then went on to told you that had we not filmed Lucky Vega, she would have died in isolation, without any parents, without anyone. Her brother, Malusi, was struggling to stay in education. They would have ended up in hell, basically. But because we filmed with her, she, uh, we were the only people that visited her in the hospital. No relatives visited her at the time we were there. We were very conscious of this and made sure that we had somebody that would visit her when we were out of the country because we weren't always in the country. What we've done as a company, True Vision, is we've actually set up our own charity so that when viewers write in and want to help kids in our films, we're actually able to support them in a way that's open and honest. Because originally people were sending in 50 p to the company around the company accounts. So we have the Aletheia Foundation. So I can tell you right now, Noki Beggar, we have just paid for a clean water bath for her because she's suffering from diarrhea because she's drinking dirty water that the cattle will feed. So, I mean, so, it's just, just me so if you hear that, does that then make the decision yeah. Yeah. right now? So, or uh, is it still wrong? I mean, the uh, question is how typical are you of, of documentary makers? What, what do you think, Sophie? You, you deal with documentary makers. Are they all as um, ethical as Jezza? Um, I think that they are. 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 I
I think there are different spectrums, and as you were saying, it's very different having uh, feature-length documentary makers like Jezza who go on and have a creative process down through to things I have more experience with, which are more new programming documentaries like Panorama and Dispatches, right down to you know ITV Daybreak and do a 15 minute. You know, and do you have similar ethical dilemmas? And Is yes, there a trade-off that James has described? Yes, so when I was at Shelter, the main sort of role for me really was between the journalist and production company and our case studies manager. And there was actually three real points of view, I think, which was to understand the motivations and the goals that the journalists had in telling the story and you know their agenda. Then there was obviously um, the people involved telling their stories about um, their situation being homeless and a certain duty of care towards their level of vulnerability and how happy they were to tell their stories. And then there was actually a third dimension as well, which I felt was more my role in, you know, we should also be aware of NGOs and organisations like IDS, that the organisational reputation as well. So I had to look out for, you know, shelters in our organisation and the campaign we were running and how it was going to fit and contribute because the main thing really is that there were, they're a really huge investment for charities and NGOs. The amount of time, I mean, one panorama, we worked in and out of it for about 12 months going back and forth. And, you know, you have to be conscious that as a charitable organisation, that represents a big investment. And you need to be comfortable that the end product is going to be beneficial, beneficial for the organisation, but also the people telling the story <coughs> and for the programme maker. But you there's always a risk, you're never going to be sure. And institutions and NGOs are risk averse, so... Yeah, I think that comes down to the leadership within organisations rather than that particular risk. But I think building up relationships with journalists and with the production team, and just, I guess, with them, okay, the <coughs> five and like you were saying, just to know that you have, you know, if you're giving access to journalists to people they wouldn't otherwise be able to reach. So for when I was working at the shelter, so um, you know, homeless hostels and people who we had given advice to and who wanted to share their stories, then you have to be confident that within your rights that organisation to probe the programme <coughs> and sit down with them and find out exactly who it's for, as you said, the working types or you know the story arc. And and it's not all, you know, negative. There are huge benefits I've found from working with program makers. And everyone is guilty of living in their own little bubble with their, you know, you think everyone understands international development and nuances and, and really working with them, they know their audiences, they know they are the specialists in getting story out to large mainstream audiences. So I think it is hugely beneficial as well to be able to develop more streamlined narratives and key messages and to be able to realise that you know it's it's a trade-off as to if it's going to benefit what you're doing and sometimes it's, you know it's not worth it and it's not going to be a benefit so you know something like a panorama that's going to take 12 months to come to fruition and you didn't know it was going to take that long for a campaign that was towards building up to a general election that was you know perfect but if it had been for a campaign that was discussing the technicalities of a local housing allowance change that was going to be based in Parliament in a month's time, it wouldn't have been worth it at all because, you know, the time would have been too late. Yeah. You know, there's all these things to weigh up. Does anyone from the audience want to contribute? Any academics? Yeah. To me, it's just to take a step back and I'd like to make a comment. Is that Can you say who you are? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Santiago Ricola. I, I work at the Rural Features Trust as a research of it. And uh, I was thinking this, this assumption that is made is that we have to tell a story and how the narrative flows is important. So like a man uh, walks into a hole and it gets out and how that is important. And I had this, and this applies to all communication and research that a friend of mine who worked in communication said, if, it's, if, if it, you can't tell a story, it doesn't exist. I always thought, is that actually true? In the sense that by us striving to create a narrative story, Aren't we actually making real? Are we actually distancing ourselves from reality and the co complexity? So, the f 
aren't we just producing a particular kind of, of, of stories that we consume and the other ones that we are willing to consume from as a TV viewer, which is a man falls into a hole and then gets out, or is it that we actually have to think, do we need to make more uh, less, less viewable things but more accurate, and then we have to train people to not just consume the usual story? Yeah, um, um, uh, I think that's a good point, but um, um, may, may television isn't very good at complex issues. <laughs> it isn't. It's good, it's good at storytelling. A mainstream audience w wouldn't come to a 90-minute film that examined TB in close detail and said everything nuanced, but it would come to watch the, the human drama. That, yeah, that, that, that's, that's the trade-off. But well, I think that also in the context of film, though, if, if, if you make a film about a man that falls in a hole and gets out, but you get there and the man falls in a hole, and within the hole there's another hole, and then there's another hole, and he keeps tumbling down holes, that's the film I make. Yeah. And I'll go back and tell Shelter, sorry, hey, it ain't the story you thought it was going to be. I'm really sorry, but this is the story. I mean, we made Evicted, which was a highly decorated film. It was directed by Brian Wood, but that's the first film I won a BAFTA on, and that was made with Shelter, all about people being evicted from their homes. Um, and that was highly successful for them because it told the stories that they wanted to tell and it hit, hit home at the right moment. So I then followed that up, so in February, or uh, well March, just after your film went out, I had a film out called Breadline Kids, which was about children using food banks the first time with their families, um, and a film called No Place to Call Home, which was my latest film on eviction, following two families. But that didn't hit it took far longer than we thought it would, and Shelter supported me with that film, but they didn't get out of it what they thought they'd get out of it. But does that really matter at the end of the day? Because the fans did. Because for me, what, what the biggest, trickiest thing for us are gatekeepers. They're the people that say, sorry, we don't think you should be talking to these people. Or why? Well, because we don't. We think that they are vulnerable and they should be protected. But don't they have a basic human right for freedom of speech? Yes, but we don't think that they should, in this occasion, have that freedom of speech. I mean, that's being quite you know, challenging, but that's what we come across. It's people who have decided, who's, who often have to make these decisions because they are what we call, what we term the gatekeeper. They are the person who ultimately will remain responsible for this family. And if you come in and you blow a family up and then you leave, they're the ones that have to pick up all the body parts, right? We don't do that, or we try not to do that. So we're going to be there, but trying to convince people that we are, that, that, that we work in a different way is really, really challenging. Um, but I think that ultimately the success of a film for me, first and foremost, is did that family get something out of that experience? Did they benefit from it in humankind? Because I can't tell anybody that anything will change for them. Every single story, every film I make, it's too late for them. You know, three of the people in TV are dead. It wasn't going to save them. So the story is about what would happen for other people. So the first challenge is getting to the people and being able to have a conversation. And then secondly, it's about convict, well, you know, discussing with them, are they prepared to invest in something that probably will not change their life, but it might change somebody else's or it might change the future for their children, if they have children. And it's a really hard thing. There was a, I landed in Gaza to make a film about the kids in um, after Operation Cast Lead. And a man, I wanted a film about the fishing boat story, because most of the stories I had, as I said, it was a retrospective story. These kids had already been blown up. So the wire had already lost his sight. Mahmoud had already had his hand half blown off. And so I was telling the stories of how they picked up their pieces and their life. But one of the dads on the fishing story said to me, well, you guys come here with your cameras, and you point them at us, and you come time and time again, and nothing changes. Nothing changes. You come back again. So why should I be in your film? And I was like, OK. Wasn't seen to see that one coming. And I thought about it for a minute. I said, well, I've flown miles away from my family to be here because I feel it's important. Why do I feel it's important? I feel it's important because we mustn't give up trying. And even if only one person changes their mind about this situation, we've achieved something. We've done something. 
That's why you should be able to film. I mean, we actually have an adage in our company, True Vision, which is dead as the light in, cannibals, because of the darkness. That's the sort of framework of it. I mean, it sounds slightly worthy, I know, I'm sorry, but you know, it is, you know, it is. And you said, said in, better to light a single, single candle, candle than to curse the darkness. Than to curse the darkness. Okay. So even, so it's better to just try and tell that one story, change that okay. one mind, because okay. you never know which one mind you might change. It might just be Mrs. Smith sat at home in Hemel Hempstead, but she might look at the world in a very different way and now change the way she's just towards her own children or her grandchildren or something. Somebody's life might be made better because of that film. And this is why it's really hard to quantify when you talk about how do you quantify and qualify the films you've made. It's really hard to know who you've changed and in what way, because it could be so left field from what you imagine. But ultimately that guy took part in the film because he realised, yeah, if we just give up now and stop, then it's definitely not going to change. Uh, let, let's just hear from Jackie. You, you've got a slightly different perspective. Yeah, I have to say I have a slightly different perspective on this um, from some of what I've heard so far, in that uh, my work has been uh, a lot using particularly um, participatory video processes with some of the um, poorest and most marginalised communities. And my approach starts from the ground level up in terms of um, using videoing and playback um, to build people's communication confidence, um, for them to use it to explore their own situations and what the issues are from their perspective and then look at making their own stories um, to take to different kinds of spaces. Some of that is about generating discussion amongst peers or within communities about not only the um, issues that people face, but how they might see change happening and what they can do. And some of that is about trying to influence policy in terms of um, providing spaces through the through the um, showing of videos made um, where people can come together on a more equal basis in terms of um, uh, trying to create uh, situations in which people living difficult lives are positioned more powerfully to express how they th what help they need and how they change they see change happening so and part of that yeah so part of that yeah so media. so is exactly any, well, so can I ask you a question is there any trade off in what you're yeah saying? no absolutely that's what i was going to say and that some of that is people making their own programs and some of it is saying you know people have time costs living difficult lives you know, not don't have the time or the energy to tell their own stories. So we also work um, with professional filmmakers to work up some of the stories, as we did at Jura in the UN post-2015 deliberation process, and take some of those messages um, into high-level policy space or wherever. The point is, even working like that and working through local partners who know communities very well there are ethical trade-offs and part of my work is not to say this is great but that actually you know we're always dealing with the balance of risk between the chance for people to um, express their perspectives um, and um, identify their own priorities about what needs to happen and the risk of exposing vulnerable people who may give consent but you know may not have done enough work to decide you know what what the risks are going to be in terms of backlash or the kind of things that you talked about J James so there are risks in that sense there are always risks then in terms of you know the kind of nuanced knowledge that we're building through the research and what we can communicate through a video because you're right that you know Com telling a compelling story has to be a simple story and some of the nuances that are important don't get communicated and also we deal a lot in terms of the kind of power, power dynamics um, between the different people we work with in situation and between them and the NGOs who work with them and between them and the outside world and there are always 
trade-offs, if you like, between um, the agendas of some people in the community and others and who's mo who are most powerful in that situation. So part of the knowledge we're building is ways to do that. And I think there are three things that we need to, or four things that we need to think about as a, as a group today. And that is, firstly, why are we doing it? You know, yeah. Jezza has talked about the change he wants to ha happen. But what, what do we think can happen through telling, you know, making documentaries and showing them? You know, what is the motivation? Because, you know, I know that all of the three panellists were trying to provoke us in the examples, but I can't help seeing um, Jezza's story as uh, more than somewhat parasitic in terms of the drive to tell a story regardless of what and what that means for the people involved. Um, and James has talked about some of the difficulties in that sense in terms of, you know, feeling that actually it was important that a message, you know, a story that hadn't been told got out and the risks of stirring things up locally. So we need to be really clear about why we're doing this. And that why question is different for different situations and different contexts. And you know the balance between the ethical trade-offs therefore changes. And I don't think I've been very clear in what we've said before so far in that. So I think that would be good to open out. I also think that we need to um, think about how we do it. And the assumption, therefore, that the best people to do this are documentary, professional documentary makers, professional storytellers. Because I, my experience is that people um, we work with can tell their stories, you know, with support, with in, you know, enabling environments well, and with time. Are, so that's another question. How? How? Yeah, they are connected. The documentary makers have access to the audience. Which yeah. Which the participant yeah, so 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 exactly. So What's we're in. Third so so, so the third one is that there are a lot of assumptions here about the way audiences read what they see, and I don't think we know enough. You know, we're talking about the change we'd like to see and changing minds and whatever, and I think. Um, we we are unclear. There's not enough data that you know that one person can change their mind. Another person may try to change their mind in a different way. So I think all of those things are things that we need to talk about. Okay. Well, you've given us um, some questions to discuss. Would anyone in the audience like to take up? Well, someone we haven't heard from yet. Yeah. Guy in the second row. Yeah. Say who you are. Uh, I'm Moni. Uh, I'm a student here. Uh, uh, as an audience, when I start watching a documentary film uh, and a feature film, as an audience, I have no difference. Like, unless and until somebody says it's a documentary film. So, as an audience, I tend to believe when I say it's a documentary film, and when I it's a feature film, when I, I, I think it, they're actors, they're acting, all those things, difference comes to my mind. But unless and until somebody says me, this is a documentary film, I do not know. So as an audience, like, it's, it doesn't matter. Like, for, for example, Titanic. There has been like ten, more than 10 documentaries on Titanic, but nobody believed. <laughs> like when Titanic, the film made, so many people, oh, this is based on real story. We believe it, and maybe many, many people that sense that way. So <coughs> if it is that the question is, can documentaries help us tell a story of the global world? Yes, they can. But which medium we choose? This, depends on the storyteller, right? So apart from this, all this ongoing debate on ethics, we must, <coughs> why I'm choosing this uh, particular media, does it, that, that make sense? Okay, so someone at the back over there. Yep. Um, thank you, uh, my name is Max Martin, I'm a geographer, working at Sussex University Department of Geography. Um, about why tell the story, I think there's an intrinsic good in telling the story, telling the truth to people without any strings attached, without any agenda. Um, you know, it could have, we don't know the effect, but telling a true story without any intentional harm to people involved, it's a, it's a good in itself. And often development organizations have problems with that because the story gets, you know, carries a lot of 
uh, interests uh, purposeful. So, it's my take on that. Thank you. I saw someone over here. Yeah. Hi, my name is Jenny Constantine. I'm a, an independent um, researcher. So I, I guess a, a, a couple of points linked to the to the why. So maybe a comment and a question. So it seems that the the common thread in in all the kind of presentations and discussions is that it really depends, in a way, where the documentary is situated and what it's for. So for example, I used to work for donor agencies, and we would commission films and you know you would have a filmmaker come and you would go from site to site and you'd visit your NGOs and it was all very prepackaged, right? I didn't think that those films were terribly impactful. They were, they were pretty, they were nice, they showed where the donor money was going, they showed subsistence farmers or women's cooperatives and there is some value in that, but you know that's that's a different thing and maybe that's one of the things that Sophie was, was talking about. And then at the very opposite end of the spectrum, there's maybe what Jezza was describing and how he makes this film, which is waiting you know, to find the story. But then maybe the, the key element in the why, or, or what for rather, is where do you situate the film in terms of its role as part of a broader conversation? So I'm looking, or I've just started to look at the role, potential role of creative industries in um, issues around obesity, nutrition, etc., and the kind of obvious example in the UK is Jamie Oliver and the sugar tax and school meals, etc. So, what happens when, for example, in the film that you made, Jess, a very, very powerful, I used to work in Swaziland, you know, what, what happens to the conversation after that film is made? How, you know, what, in a way, what responsibility do you as a filmmaker or as a, as a producer have to continue the conversation, you know, with the knowledge you have either with the NGOs locally or with government, you know, how do we make films more impactful in a way by linking them into broader policy debates, advocacy, etc., you know, all this sort of stuff. And I suppose the reason why I ask that question is because in, in the context of this, again using the Jamie Oliver example, thinking of the sugar tax, this is a discussion that I'm having with colleagues currently, in a way that the success of the, and I can't remember what it was, but the success of the particular documentary that was made on this is the fact that the sugar tax um, is going to become law. There are all sorts of problems with the sugar tax that actually you know, mean it may not be successful. But the film hinges, and future films made by that production company, hinge on their very success. So in a way, thinking of, of the, the sort of ethics of accountability, we don't necessarily have an incentive to talk about the failures where films don't work or where documentaries don't tell the right story or where they're not reflective or, you know, and James was, was very honest in sharing some of the, the drawbacks. So I suppose it, it would be great to hear from those of you who, who and, and Jesse, you know, you're nodding, it'd be great to hear about how you sort of take that responsibility both in the, in the commissioning and the production process but also in the, the follow-up and how does it link to broader sort of debates and, and processes, if you like. Sorry, that's about 12 questions. No, well, I mean, I'm sorry, let, we're just, we're, let's just keep hearing from the audience. We'll come back to, I'll ask you all about impact. There's someone here. Uh, hello, yes, my name's Karen Boswell. Uh, I've been a documentary filmmaker for 30 years telling other people's stories and feel <coughs> that with the new technology available, both in terms of the way you capture stories and the way you can share it with mobile technology that my sort of ethical obligation now is to support others to tell their own stories and to withdraw from telling other people's where previously we had very complicated equipment which was that expensive and difficult to use now actually we can support others to tell their own story but I also felt that you mentioned um, actually what we do is we give people access to audience that was one thing that was mentioned and I, I feel I said that documentary makers documentaries don't have access why, yeah, the question was to an audience. Why? What's the motivation for documentary filmmakers? And one of the answers could be because they give access to an audience. So I was just throwing it out there that actually maybe we could spend more of our energies supporting accessing an audience. Yeah. Than well, let's come back to that issue of impact. Yeah. There's a couple of comments here. And I'm Richard Jolly here at RDS, but I was uh, 15 years with UNICEF, where media and the use of film was very important to us. Um, I'd like to make one comment. I'm very pleased the discussion of the ethics of filming that uh, girl with TB 
has moved to broader elements of ethics because to me the ethics are always going to be complicated as James brought out and trade offs goodness knows what. But also the question of where is the audience? I have no problem with telling a story, but in relation to a different story about global development, the point I would make is that at least many people ought to be bringing out not just poverty, problems, but how that links to the whatever the context in the broader sense is. It can be done, very difficult, has to always be somewhat selective, tell a story, but it needs to have that global perspective, I would say linked to global development. And secondly, we always in UNICEF wanted to bring in positive actions that could be taken, usually by examples of where they were being taken, in addition to the problems we were showing. Okay, uh, we've had some comments on Twitter. Uh, David, Diarmi, and Zoe Hamilton, what kind of ethical compromises are acceptable and what sort of compromises are unacceptable? And then um, echoing the point from the audience, Nadia Stone, are we underestimating our audiences to say TV can't show complexity? Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, we've sort of got two themes. One, one is about impact. How do you maximize the impact? What actually is the impact? Why are we doing these things? Um, uh, and let, let, I'll come to you on impact, but let's just hear a few more audience comments. Well, yeah, I'll just continue the conversation with the ladies, but uh, my name is Cindy Gordon. I'm, uh, I'm in education, I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I also founded an organisation called the Women's Premium Officer in South Africa that trained women um, of African diaspora to tell their own stories through the medium of film. Um, I also worked on a documentary series for PBS in. Um, in the US for four years, and which meant that I was um, working on a, on a Native American reservation. And I remember turning up, who was the, the um, there was me as a director, the filmmaker was Navajo, the sound um, person, she was from, she was Japanese American. And when we, we turned up, there was a German crew, and then there was us, and they automatically went to the German crew. And then when they found out that it was us, it was completely, totally in shock. And I think if we talk about how do we tell a different story, although this has been told so many times, is that it comes down to the filmmakers. I mean, even the way that we look, starting a different story, starting a different dialogue, because it also diminished that distance of the other, the subject of the other. And there was an engagement. Sometimes I feel that when it's the other, these ethical considerations, um, that that also can affect that. But also in the filmmaking process, it was just totally different because a conversation started right at the beginning. They were asking us questions. They were intrigued with us. We was also having to, it was this filmmaking of all differences. And we told a different story. There was there's no other way it was going to be there was a different direction from the beginning. So in a way, when I, it's just like even this panel, the panel has to change. We're talking about global development, we're talking about often, it just has to change. It's been looking like this for 40 or 50 years. And, and this is a start of telling a different story. It yeah. starts with the filmmaker, yeah. it starts with the panel, it starts yeah. with We'll come to you in a second, yeah. Hi, um, my name's Aliska, I'm an MA student here in um, at IDS, and I'm kind of sitting in the middle of, of both these pieces. My brother's actually a documentary filmmaker, makes very similar films to you, Jezza, um, as well, so very familiar with kind of that side, and also working on my own, about to work on my own participatory video project for my dissertation here. Um, and I think that there's definitely validity in both pieces, and certainly really respect the participatory, how do we help people engage, and also how do we reach that writer or audience. I wonder if some of this, I mean, also knowing the documentary filmmakers don't always have time, you're moving on to the next project. Is it reasonable to say, and I really like Jenny's con um, comment about having that conversation, but I also wonder if that's some of where development workers, NGOs, other people in the community can play some of that bridge to say if there's been a project happening here, can we help lead or can other people lead that conversation with the community that follows up, that engages, that critiques it, that widens that discussion? Um, 
when it may or may not be realistic for the documentary filmmaker themselves to be the one that continues that, um, to really widen that impact and that discussion, because I think that is, is valuable in that sense as well, and can that be some way that sort of bridges between, between some of those different needs um, to expand the impact? Yeah, that's Anyone that's else who hasn't problem. spoken? Yeah. 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 Um, then, I'm quite interested in the interface between the documentary uh, makers and the audience. We've talked a lot about the kind of people in the documentary. Um, and as the point that you made, Ronnie, about you know films versus documentaries, actors versus actual people. Um, what is the, I guess, in telling the story of global development, I think that certainly in the UK there's a lot of cynicism around um, how we tell that story, especially uh, how the NGO tell, the world tells that story, this kind of very... Uh, you know, they'll talk about things like poverty porn, there's kind of a very particular anger, angle on what poverty is, and people that are, are getting, you know, um, their eyes glaze over when they see sort of the African kid image on telly. Um, you know, in fact, we, you know, every time when I watch Comic Relief on my behalf, she actually switches over the, the uh, channel when it gets to the documentary bit because she's like, I want to see the comedy, I'm not interested in the usual story about whatever. You know, she, she's married to a development professional, so, <laughs> so I should have said, My name's only, I work at my DS. So, what, how, what do we do? Like, well, how do we gain back that trust in our audience? How do we tell? Because both of these things, a film is a story, a documentary is a story, neither, neither of them are the actual reality because it, there seems to be that you know the actual reality is not a thing that be told because there's too many things going on we have to zoom in on a particular aspect of that reality in order for that story to happen so what do we how do we gain that audience trust again especially in the world of everyone's got their smartphones um, you know ISIS are circulating videos that we don't know whether or not they've happened you know, there's a lot of speculation on things that we see on screen we don't know if it's true we don't know who's in it we don't know who's behind it we don't know why they've done it as an audience and there's, there's still a little bit of TV trust. We still trust the big brands like BBC and things like that, but immediately everyone was cynical about Channel 5. So in this room, we don't trust Channel 5, but some people do. So what, what is it that needs to be that, that, that chemistry with the audience to tell them, this is okay, we've done the right things, the people in here are, are saying something genuine, even if it's something that's a little bit artificial and, you know, positioned in a certain okay. way. Okay, yeah. Go. Uh, do you think it's photographer, uh, student at the University of Brighton. Um, I'd just like to start off by saying that when I first started my talking course, we were, uh, we discussed the notion of truth and the fact that it really doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Everyone who tells a story tells a story from a particular perspective mm -hmm. and it's your mm -hmm. job as the, as the onlooker, the member of the audience, to figure out what that might be and whether you accept it or not. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose that's the first thing. Mm -hmm. The second thing is that, you know, this the idea of authorship and responsibility, building a framework for what we're making, what we make in the beginning is part of the package of the idea. And, you know, one an, an approach to make it part of the package would be to say, okay, we want to make a film, at the end of this film, we would like to work with X organisations to ensure that Y happens. I don't know if that's mm -hmm. part of one of the packages. I see it. I, I hope she also add that I work a lot with my local community. So that, that's part of my responsibility. Um, and I suppose that's the final thing I'd say is that, you know, the world isn't as connected as we assume it is. And so therefore, you know, in recent conversations at university, I've been talking about um, certain, you know, some countries are still very uh, disconnected in terms of the internet and etc. power. So therefore, you, there, we run the risk of the same people having the same conversations with the same people mm -hmm. and not necessarily uh, the message getting to where it needs to get to. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, <coughs> I just wanted to give a couple of case studies about the work that we did which surprisingly had amazing impact. We didn't know it would have that kind of impact, but it did. One was a docudrama that we did with Channel 4 and with South Africa, SABC, and young directors, young writers, young actors, young non-actors as well, uh, who were coming to the scene. This was in 94 when it came out. It was actually seen, it was a three-part drama, docudrama series for Channel 4. We did it in tandem with The Guardian, with The New Internationalist, 
we did a, an education pack around it. It was seen by just about every adult in South Africa. It had a big impact in Europe and in the States as well. But it was seen as a result of the ANC just coming on, on stream as, as uh, the, the, the government in power and so on. It was on every chat show. It was on every newspaper. And so we didn't know it was going to have that impact. But the fact is that it was a combination of non-actors, actors, and allowing people in South Africa to have a voice. And it was the first time that black South Africans were seen not just as buffoons or as terrorists, <coughs> but as ordinary human beings who had their own aspirations and their own concerns. Okay, thank you. Um, I need to draw things to a conclusion. Sorry if you didn't get the chance to speak. Um, I'm going to come to the panel for a final comment. I mean, I think there are two themes to, when we moved on from ethics, there clearly is an ethical trade-off, two themes that we can maybe just explore in the final comments. Um, one is about impact. Um, how, how do we make documentary have impact? And, I mean, why are we making these documentaries? Which is your question. And the second is audiences. Where is the audience at? How do we make films that do engage an audience? Are we underestimating the audience <coughs> or, or, or are commissioning editors underestimating the audience? So if members of the panel, you could just take one of those, impact or audiences. Um, Sophie, let's start with you. Yeah, uh, so on impact, I guess from my experience, I've worked with families who, as a result of being on television program like Panorama have been housed and councils have come under lots of pressure and there have been very, you know, positive <coughs> impacts for individuals. I've also experienced fans that um, documentaries, if they have the right um, sort of awareness raising campaigns around with them, so that's a lot of NGOs, you know, working together with production companies, they can build up a lot of momentum um, with individuals, fundraisers, and political pressure <coughs> to have um, real impact. Um, and yeah, I guess that's kind of linked to a, a point that Emily raised around how NGOs present stories. And in my experience, fundraising and money is a lot of the drivers. And if that's how fundraising is most effective, then they'll keep doing it. But I do have a feeling that it's just sort of slightly shifting at the moment. But okay. Jackie? Yeah, I think we need to think about impact in a more complex way as well. So, we, you know, what the impact of the people doing our documentaries are and whether, you know, the ethical trade-off is not right, if it repositions people less powerfully as vulnerable people when they could be part of uh, changing their own lives, <coughs> the impact on, you know, the, the wider community, the impact in terms of wider audiences. That, that's one thing we need to be a lot more savvy, you know, the, the impact I worked with, um, probably the longest project was with a group of people with learning disabilities who became um, a semi-professional crew themselves and make videos for other people. And the impact of that, not only in terms of their lives and what it's meant for them, to be advising others on how people with learning disabilities are represented and making their own films and teaching other people on social work courses about what they're doing. But also on the wider the wider forms that they've influenced in that way by taking on those roles. So there are lots of things there. And I also think there's some confusion here in the in the discussion between um, impact and distribution and audiences if you like because we've been saying the film has an impact because it's been seen by all pe these people you know that just because something's distributed doesn't mean that anything changes and we need to be more savvy about defining the different types of audiences as you said and what's appropriate for okay kitty yes well i would just like to echo those concerns and follow up on that maybe i think there is indeed a next step beyond up, um, distributing and broadcasting and, and then looking at what happens in interaction with the audience and um, I mean I think we had some great comments about telling the truth versus telling a simple story um, and the truth just isn't simple and so whenever we show something about people's people's lives on benefits or um, parents 
uh, teaching their children something or um, how they cope with poverty. There's always different ways of interpreting that, and, and some people may, may um, see that as a reinforcement of stereotypes that they've already had, whilst others might be challenged and might indeed change their opinion. But I think we need to be a bit more critical um, of that, and that what we intend to do with the documentary and film might not necessarily be how it is received or how it, we, how it will happen. Jessa? Um, so yeah, I seem to have got stuck in the micro of um, micro stories of, of ethics, but you know, ethics is much bigger than those micro stories. Impact, you know, impact is down to the individual filmmaker. Um, go to our website, trivisiontv.com, and you'll see a plethora of impact that we've had, from funds raised to eradicate slavery in the Kirkuk plantations, Cote d'Ivoire, through to education programs we've got running in Zimbabwe now. It's about engaging with the NGOs or local, where possible local NGOs who are working in the areas that the film is ultimately going to tackle. I do not make a films for popcorn and television. We make films to make a difference. What that difference is, I don't have ultimate control over, but I will do everything within my power to make sure the films, the transmission of the film is the beginning of its life, not the end of its life. So therefore, I've had films screened at various things and, and, and used by Save the Children with a report to the government. It's been used by shelter eviction multiple times here. Um, we've, you know, I, it's all on the website, I'm not going to bang on, but I didn't touch on it because I don't want to sound like, oh, look at us, we're so super worthy, but <laughs> that's what we do do, we do make film, and it starts with the very concept of the film, I am talking to the people who work in this field and working out what life can that film have, what good can it do, what message can it get out, how can it support work, how can it be the human face of the statistics, as far as audience goes, You've got to remember, Channel 5, BBC 3, BBC 4, BBC 1, they're different audiences. They have to be framed differently. Look at this Channel 5 program. It's had an impact. It's been used today. Filmmakers had no idea that would be shown here today, but it has. You might not like it, but you've created a debate, a discussion, a platform, a forum. In a Benefit Street, I was pulled on a panel to be the sort of worthy side of Benefit Street because I made four kids that was critically acclaimed, whereas people hit Benefit Street, but you could not not argue that Benefit Street created the debate. Everyone was talking about it. This issue was suddenly highlighted again. Who knows what change that has had? And I think that's really important. And I think that there is a place. And yes, also, <coughs> local people taking control and doing things for themselves. Save the Children's one second film. Brilliant impact. They had hundreds of thousands of viewers on Twitter using social media. Absolutely brilliant. Forward thinking, find new ways. Do it in US. But there's still a place for films like the films where because there is a demand. If dispatches want to film on Gaza, I think that it would be quite good if I had the opportunity to make that film, because I think I'll make it in a really useful way. And well the best way, I mean all I can say is I can make the best films to the best of my ability to fall within the remits and giving voice to people who might not otherwise have a voice. James. Yeah, I think someone asked the question earlier, you know, whether we should be what's the value of engaging professional filmmakers? And I, I realise, having given my slightly negative example, I don't want it to go down, but this time I go and speak to an ideas researcher. Oh, we've got someone from a production company on the phone. Will you work with him? He said, well, no way, not after what you told me. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually an advocate for working with um, professional filmmakers like Jezza. And I think one of the reasons for that is because I also think that those of us who work in development, um, we have a responsibility to enrich the popular discourse around these issues. And right now, you know, there are a lot of people in the establishment who would like to see the BBC's, for example, international factual programming go down, be reduced. These programmes are under huge pressure. They're not the biggest, um, the, not the biggest shows for, in terms of ratings. And so, you know, we need to support, in a way, filmmakers like Jezza, who are then having to sell these ideas up to commissioning editors, to kind of support them to make, continue to make these programmes. Because they, they will decline. And I think here in the UK, we're relatively lucky, in, in, or we're very lucky in the quality of what is produced, albeit with some, some problems along the way. Um, and I think in relation to audience, I think what we haven't had time to touch on today, but this is something I'm really interested in, is the changing nature of development is going to make us e going to get even yeah. more complicated and contested. 
you know, there's clearly a difference between how you operate as a European or an American making a film in a developing country and how you would make that same film covering similar issues in, inside the UK. I too have to switch off comic relief because I cannot bear to watch them interview a woman who has just lost her child five minutes earlier as she comes out of the house pit mm -hmm. and point a camera in her face and ask her how she feels about that because they wouldn't do it to a British woman. So there are, well, as, the, as the nature of development changes, those stories are going to get even more interesting and we're going to have to work even more closely with, with, with producers like Jezza. Well, one of my favourite producers is Sam Bignall because I think he came up with a brilliantly different way to tell the development story. I don't know how many of you have seen uh, The Toughest Place to Be series by Sam Bignall where he takes like, a British cabbie and he goes and visa. He often lives with an Indian cabbie for a couple of weeks and has to drive his car. An ingenious way for people to tell their stories from their own perspectives, um, but actually still make it really, really accessible and engaging for a, for, a, for a global audience or a UK audience. So let's keep on trying. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, um, I've got two takeaways. Um, one is I think we need to be much smarter in the way we think about media. Uh, and engage with filmmakers. Um, I mean, we're lucky to have Jezza. He is something of a role model, and n not not all filmmakers are like that. And I think the second takeaway is, if we do engage with filmmakers, we can help them to raise their game and make better films that reach audiences and have impact. But um, please join me in thanking the panel. <laughs>